Hi everybody and welcome back for another great week of marketing. Um, this week we're going to be talking about advertising, public relations, and sales promotions. So we're going to get started here with advertising, um, which will take the majority of the duration of our lecture today. This is kind of a long chapter, so bear with me. Remember, you do have the ability to pause and replay if you need to during the course of this lecture. And of course, I do want to take a moment to remind you that these video lectures should in no way be a substitution for reading the chapter in its entirety. So as we get started today, I want to talk about what is advertising. A lot of people um, start to confuse advertising and marketing, and some people think of them as synonymous, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But first, our book's definition of advertising is a paid form of communication delivered through media from an identifiable source about an organization, product, service, or idea designed to persuade the receiver to take some action now or in the future. So to some of us, that sounds like Greek upon a, a first reading. So Let's break it down just a moment. Let's talk about um, the various steps of advertising. So uh, first of all, advertising is not free. Somebody is paying for advertising, either with money, trade, or some other means to get the message shown. Second, advertising must be carried by some medium. Okay, so whether that medium is TV, radio, print, the internet, t-shirts, uh, people walking down the sidewalk, Whatever it is, um, there's some type of medium carrying your advertising message. Number three, legally, the source of the message must be known or knowable. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And number four, advertising represents a persuasive form of communication designed to get the customer to take some kind of action. Now, usually that action we want them to take is, you probably guessed, a purchase, okay? However, it's not always a purchase. Sometimes you want them to adopt a certain idea or a mentality, a way of thinking. Sometimes you want them to change a certain behavior. So these actions can be different things, but generally you're talking about a purchase. Okay, so, um, we all live in the 21st century, you've been walking around, you see advertisements pretty much everywhere. And um, advertising has been growing a lot in recent years and predictions are that it will continue to grow. However, one of the, the downsides of advertising is you don't always remember a lot of it. So uh, yesterday, you were probably exposed to 10, 20 advertisements. But how many of those do you remember today? Probably not many, I can't think of a single advertisement right off the top of my head that I saw last night while watching TV. So the other thing about advertising, especially TV advertising that's become a little bit problematic in recent years is that our research actually shows that 92% of millennials um, say that while they're watching TV, they're also checking their mobile devices and simultaneously talking to people and doing texting and doing other things. Um, I'm guilty of this myself, so I can't say much. I, I email and watch TV a lot in the evenings. Um, so you're not really focused on those advertisements. You're not paying attention to them. Some, sometimes they just pass through our brains and we're not even paying attention. We're so immune because we see so many different advertisements. So what do we do as marketers to make sure that our advertising campaign is successful? Well, that's what we're going to talk about now. Oh, and here's a picture of a millennial here on five devices at once. Okay, so as a consumer, you're generally only exposed to that finished advertisement, that, that ad you see on TV or on your phone or on the sidewalk. But there's actually a whole lot that goes into this process before we get to that finished advertisement. There's, there's a whole lot, and we're going to talk about those steps today and how to plan a successful advertising campaign. And of course, it does require a lot of planning and a lot of effort. Um, and we have a little series of steps here. And we're going to go through each one of these individually. But starting first, we have to identify our target audience. This is our first step. Um, this just involves some research, uh, researching different, different audiences, different people. What do we know about them? So we're going to identify that target audience. And then we're going to use all this information that we know about that target audience to kind of set the tone for our advertising program. Um, and this will also help us later to select the specific type of media that we're going to use to deliver our message to our target audience. Okay, so um, something that's hard for a lot of people to get past is when you're doing this research and you're trying to identify your target audience, it may or may not be the current user of your product. 
It may be someone different, okay? It could be your current user, but it could be somebody who's not using your product that you want to use your product. So there's a lot of different options here. So you kind of have to think outside of the box as you're trying to identify your target audience. Our second step is to actually set the advertising objectives, okay? And these objectives are usually derived from whatever your overall objective of your marketing program is and whatever goal that your ad is trying to accomplish. That's, that's how we arrive at our advertising objectives, okay? And usually these advertising objectives are listed in an advertising plan, which is just a subsection of the company's overall marketing plan that kind of identifies um, explicitly the marketing and advertising situation, the objectives of the advertising campaign, a specific strategy for accomplishing those objectives, and then indicating how the firm can determine whether that campaign was successful, some metrics. So if that sounds like Greek to you, that's okay. Uh, remember, this is just an introductory marketing course, so you're not supposed to leave as an expert of marketing. That's not your, your goal here. Our goal is just to kind of get you introduced to marketing and slightly to advertising so that you kind of know what to expect. And if you go on to be a marketing major, you'll take entire courses in constructing a marketing plan or writing an advertising plan. So um, just know that you're not supposed to be an expert just yet. What I do want you to know, though, what I do want you to take away is that these advertising objectives are our second step in our, in our campaign and that having an advertising plan is crucial because later, that's how we're going to measure whether or not our advertising succeeded or failed. Uh, later, we're going to use those objectives that are in that advertising plan and all those things we've talked about, our strategy and our target group and um, we're going to use some marketing metrics to go back and measure later whether or not this advertising plan was successful. Okay, as a part of our advertising objectives, we typically see either a push or a pull strategy. Okay, so think about a door. You can either push or you can pull. Um, in a pull strategy, um, this is when our advertising objectives um, focus on getting consumers to actually pull the product into the marketing channel by demanding more of it. And I'm going to give you some examples of these in just a moment, okay? But pull strategies try to pull in consumers. Remember it that way. Pull strategies are trying to pull in consumers by demanding the product more. A push strategy is when we write our advertising objectives um, with the goal of increasing demand by wholesalers or retailers or salespeople who are demanding our product, it's more so focused to those businesses. So our push strategies try to motivate sellers to kind of highlight the product rather than our competitors' products. And in that respect, we are kind of pushing the product onto consumers, okay? So think about it this way. We're either pulling consumers to demand our product or we're pushing our product onto all of these businesses to get them to sell our product. So either a push or a pull strategy. Okay, and we're gonna look at some examples of these in just a moment. Um, so if we were in a real classroom right now, I would give you a real pop quiz, but since we're online, I want you to take a moment and I want you to pause, uh, pause our video, read this question, and then I want you to try to guess for an answer. Okay, so it tells you that Procter & Gamble uses a sense-off campaign, couponing, and free samples to try to increase sales of their Tide detergent. So what kind of promotional strategy are they using? Kinetic, personal selling, pull, or push? Well, we can start by crossing out A and B because those don't exist. Okay, so we're down to pull and push. Which one is it? Well. If we're giving out all these sense off campaigns and we're giving out coupons, we're giving out free samples, this is a pull promotional strategy because we're trying to pull consumers in by increasing demand for our product. Okay, so uh, even if you don't need Tide right this second, gosh, you have a coupon and you get so many cents off, or hey, there's a free sample of this. We're trying to pull in consumers. We're trying to pull in those groups that have never tried Tide. We're trying to offer coupons so that if they would like to. Um, you know, stock up, stockpile, they can do that. So lots of different options here. Um, so 
One thing that you also need to know, and this is a huge takeaway, I promise you will see this on your quiz and your final and all your assignments, this is a huge takeaway, but typically advertising campaigns have three broad objectives for the target audience, and this is kind of our goal of promotion too in general. Um, so we want to inform, persuade, and remind, and we're going to talk about how advertisements can be geared to do each one of these things in just a moment. But generally, an advertising campaign always has these three broad objectives in mind, either informing, persuading, or reminding consumers of something. Um, another way to look at advertising objectives is to look at an ad's focus. Okay, So maybe the ad is designed to stimulate some kind of demand for a product or for a service. Or maybe it's just kind of a broad ad for the institution in general and not for a specific, excuse me, for a specific product. So um, we're going to look at some examples of each of these. So here's a, a cute little advertisement for some, some pet food. And I want you to tell me if this advertisement, based on what you think, either informs, persuades, or reminds. And you can notice here by looking at our screen, it says our food is as natural as it says it is. And the blonde hair, yeah, that's natural too, because notice these are both like orange, just blonde animals. So there's a lot of different things going on here. So to some degree, you can argue that this advertisement is informational, because if you've never heard of Im's Pet or in their, their animal food, uh, you're kind of learning about that, and you're learning that it's as natural as it says it is. Um, you're reminding our various patrons what this particular advertisement offers. And as a result, we're kind of fulfilling all three of our advertising objectives. We're informing people about our ad. It's This is animal food. We're persuading them to buy. Um, and we're reminding them that it's all natural. So kind of um, hitting all three of those here. Usually your ads focus on one of the three, but this one in particular just hit all three. So let's talk a little bit about how we want to inform with our advertising. So informative advertising is a communication that is used to create and build brand awareness with the ultimate goal of moving the consumer through the buying cycle to make a purchase. Okay, So the big goal here with informational advertising is to create and build brand awareness. Typically, um, this advertising usually takes place during the early stages of a product's life cycle. Usually, whenever, whenever a lot of customers don't have a lot of information about the product or the type of product yet. So very helpful in those early stages of the product life cycle that we talked about before. Um, in other cases, retailers might just use this informative advertising to kind of tell their customers about an upcoming sales event or the arrival of some new merchandise. So informative advertising can be useful for those reasons. Persuasive advertising, on the other hand, um, after a product has gained a certain level of brand awareness, and it's already kind of been out there for a little bit, firms will use this persuasive advertising to motivate consumers to take some action. So typically, you see this persuasive advertising occurring during the growth and maybe even the early maturity stages of the product lifecycle. Uh, that's usually when competition is most intense and when we're trying to accelerate the market's acceptance of the product. Now, it's also common for persuasive advertising to sometimes be used in later stages of the product life cycle to reposition a brand that's already been established um, and kind of persuade customers to change their existing perceptions of an advertised product. So. Uh, you see this in, in all stages of the product life cycle, but generally the growth and early maturity. Here's an example of um, what we were just talking about here with how persuasive advertising might be used to reposition a brand. You see um, here we have the Lancome brand, and they a lot of times will persuade customers to take action with, this, with their persuasive advertising. Uh, but usually they're trying to persuade customers to switch brands or try a new product. Occasionally, uh, maybe just to have them continue buying the product that's already been advertised, but usually trying to get people to switch brands and um, let them know that, that their product will do just as much as others. So persuasive advertising can be used in a lot of different ways. Finally, reminder advertising is communication that's used to remind your prompt repurchases 
Typically, you see reminder advertising for products that have already gained market acceptance and they're usually already in the maturity stages of their product life cycles. Typically, reminder advertising will appear in traditional media like television and um, television commercials or print like a newspaper, but it also segues into other forms of advertising as well. Here's a really good example for you about reminder advertising that might help kind of put this into perspective. So when you're going to the store and you're thinking about how you might need to buy some tissues, do you sit there and consider every single option, looking at the sizes of the boxes, the prices, how well this one performs, or do you just kind of grab the first thing you see on the shelf? Um, when Kroger or whatever grocery store that you visit places a display of Kleenexes on um, a point of purchase display on an end cap or something. Um, they're relying on your top of mind awareness of the Kleenex brand. And the manufacturer has generally achieved this through advertising. Remember that the synonyms are present there. Kleenex and tissue are almost synonymous for a lot of us. And in this case, the advertising and the end cap, the fact that it's there and it's convenient, it's right there on the end of an aisle, kind of prompt you and a lot of other consumers to just go ahead and buy that Kleenex, to go ahead and plop that into the box. So reminder advertising in this case, Kleenex already had top of mind awareness. When you thought about tissues, you thought about Kleenex, uh, but it was right there and it was convenient. They were reminding you of their product. So remember, our three broad objectives for advertising our ads either want to inform, persuade, or remind consumers. So here's a little quiz for you. Give this one a try. You can pause me and come back. So it says, advertising slogans such as don't drink and drive and buy flood insurance before it's too late. It says these are examples of ads that are designed to A, recruit employees, B, persuade customers to take action, C, remind consumers, or D, provide information. If you're telling someone to buy flood insurance before it's too late, that's pretty persuasive. You're trying to persuade your customers to take action. Um, in the same way with not texting and driving, you're not asking them to purchase anything, but you're asking them to accept a mentality and an idea, uh, which is also a form of marketing in itself as well. So. Here's one more question for you to try, and again, please go ahead and pause me. For many years during December, Coca-Cola has run a series of commercials showing the Coke, excuse me, showing the Coke polar bears playing, and then in the end, relaxing with a bottle of Coke. You've probably seen these ads for many years. What is this promotion intended to do? Either A, act as a persuasive device for the product category, B, act as a reminder advertisement, C, persuade non-users of Coke to try it, or D, amuse consumers? Well, Coke's been out there for many, many years. It's obviously um, in the later stages of the product life cycle, in which case we typically see the reminder advertising taking place. Okay, most people already know about Coke. They're already familiar with it. You're probably unlikely to persuade a non-Coke user if you're a Pepsi person. Um, this whole advertising for Coke is probably not going to persuade you to become a Coke user. Okay, so in this case, uh, persuasion is not usually the goal, and of course, amusement is not a, an advertising goal. So, uh, not directly at least. So we're going for a reminder advertising here. Okay, so as we keep looking through, I just have one more of these for you. Persuasion normally becomes the primary promotion goal when A, selling a highly technical product, B, the product enters the growth stage of the product life cycle. C, a firm is trying to increase brand awareness. D, new products are in early stages of the product life cycle. Or E, reminding consumers where to buy the product. So usually persuasion is the goal whenever what? Well, think about it. Um, you're probably not going to remind if persuasion is your goal. So you can cross out letter E. D says that new products are in the early stages of the product life cycle. We do know that persuasion is usually used generally in the growth stage, but also in other stages. So maybe D or B are good choices here. 
we know that with brand awareness, that's usually more of an informed kind of thing. And selling a technical product has nothing to do with this. So you can cross that one out too. So we've kind of narrowed it down to either B or D. In this case, the really big differentiating factor here is the word new. Okay, the product does not have to be new in order for persuasion to normally be the promotion goal. Okay, it can be in um, a product that's been out for a little while and they're just changing it or revamping it. So the correct answer here would be B. Persuasion normally becomes the primary promotion goal when the product enters the growth stage of the product life cycle. Okay, so we've kind of talked about how ads obviously are generally product focused, meaning that they're either seeking to inform, persuade, or remind. However, an ad's focus can also have an institutional focus or it could have a public service focus. And we're gonna talk about both of these in just a moment. So for institutional advertising, uh, we refer to this as a type of advertising that promotes a company or an organization, a business, um, not necessarily a product. Unlike product-focused advertisements, this institutional advertising is usually not intended to sell a certain product or a certain service. A great and really popular example of institutional advertising is GE's Ecomagination. And it's kind of funny, kind of ironic, because in the past, GE was never really viewed as being a green company. In fact, it was one of the least green companies. But uh, starting in 2005, GE started this eco-imagination program where they just poured millions and millions of dollars towards developing cleaner technologies, uh, everything from water purification to lower emission engines, the development of like wind and solar power. They've, they've thrown all of this money into this eco-imagination product. Now, that might not necessarily be there to get you to purchase their products as much as it is just um, institutional advertising for their brand as a whole and for their company name. Um, and here's a, a photo of their eco-imagination product. Okay, our last form, advertising can also be geared toward public service advertising or what you hear abbreviated as PSAs. These are usually focused on public welfare so, and they're usually sponsored by some kind of nonprofit or a religious or a civic group, sometimes a political group. And a lot like product advertising and institutionally focused advertising, PSAs always inform, persuade, or remind customers, but the focus is not on a product, it's on the betterment of society. And PSAs in that respect also represent a form of social marketing. Uh, which your book defines as the application of marketing principles to a social issue to bring about attitudinal and behavioral change. So I'm going to give you some examples of these. Um, Reba McIntyre is obviously a world-renowned singer. You might have seen the Reba show as well. Um, but in this case, Reba's not marketing herself or her TV show or any of her products. She is a spokesperson for the PSA Outnumber Hunger which is designed to raise awareness for America's hunger problem. So in this case, she's marketing for this particular uh, nonprofit group, Outnumber Hunger. She's not marketing for herself. Okay, so that would be an example of institutional advertising or a public service announcement more so. Um, so here's a little quiz question for you. Go ahead and pause me, please. So Procter & Gamble has run ads that promote its children's safe drinking water program in which it shows employees teaching people around the world how to purify their water. This program was instituted because 5,000 children die every day from diseases caused by unsafe water. So these ads are examples of what kind of advertising? Is Procter & Gamble advertising a product? No. So this is not product advertising. In this case, this would be an example of institutional advertising. Okay, uh, They're trying to show that they're doing something good in the community. They're showing that Procter & Gamble is a good company, but they're not necessarily um, marketing a certain product. Okay, our third step is determining the advertising budget. And budgeting is always fun, right? in any job or any profession, budgeting is always difficult. Um, so 
First, our firms obviously have to consider the role that advertising is going to play in their attempt to meet the overall promotional goals. And then we need to look second at our advertising expenditures and how they vary over the course of the product life cycle. And this is sort of interesting. The nature of the market and the product also influence the size of the advertising budget. And the nature of the market also determines the amount of money spent on advertising. So I know all that probably sounds like Greek. So let's take a moment and think about this. So um, business to consumer advertising, we typically spend a whole lot more money there than say business to business advertising. So depending on the type of product, the type of company you have, and what it is that you're advertising, you can kind of look at all these different things. So you need to look at your stage in the product life cycle, the size of the market and the target group you're trying to hit. And then of course, look at whether this is a business to consumer transaction or a business to business transaction. So once we've set our budget, we next want to go about conveying our message. And there's two components here, but in this step, marketers determine what they want to convey about the product or service, what message they want to give away. And after they've determined this message, they next need to decide what appeal would most effectively convey that message. So um, even though these are listed here first and second, these just kind of happen simultaneously. So what is it that you want to convey to your target audience and how do you want to do that? And I'm going to break these up into portions for you. So the message usually provides the target audience with reasons to respond a certain way. It's a logical starting point for deciding on the advertising message and usually is touting the key benefits of the product or the service. The message generally communicates some kind of problem solving ability um, and it's usually very clear, very compelling, very concise. Um, and in this aspect, advertisers have to remember that products and services solve problems, okay? You're always trying to solve a consumer's problem, creating value for them. So this may be a real problem like world hunger, or it could be a perceived problem. So um, for example, when you're thinking about, let's say you own a drill company, like you're Black & Decker and you're trying to sell some drills, people usually aren't just looking for a quarter inch drill bit. They're looking for a quarter inch holes to hang a picture on the wall. And because there's so many different ways to make a quarter inch hole, a firm like Black & Decker really has to convey to consumers that its drill is the best way to get that hole done. Okay, so they're solving some kind of problem. They, they posed a problem and their product provides the solution to that problem. Another common strategy, if you don't want to try to solve a problem, um, another common strategy differentiates a product by establishing its unique benefits. So we talked about this earlier in the semester, but this distinction usually forms the unique selling proposition or also known as the value proposition. And this is also commonly seen as a slogan or a theme along with an advertising campaign. And generally speaking, a good unique selling proposition communicates the unique attributes of the product. It kind of becomes a whole snapshot of the entire campaign. So I'm going to say a few things here. Let me give you a few examples of a few unique selling propositions. And I bet you're going to be able to identify what they are. So Red Bull gives you wing. For Nike, we say, just do it. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. TNT, we know drama, okay? So these are all unique selling propositions that kind of tell you what each of these companies do, okay? So with your message, you can either present a problem and show how your product provides a solution to that problem, or you can differentiate a product by describing its unique benefits, uh, by showing its value proposition, okay? Um, Next, once you have your message intact, we need to talk a little bit about the appeal. So advertisers a lot of times will use different appeals to portray their products or services and persuade consumers to purchase them. 
Usually though, you can classify the appeals into two distinct categories, either informational appeals or emotional appeals. With an informational appeal, we're trying to help consumers make some kind of purchase decision by offering factual information that encourages consumers to evaluate the brand favorably on the basis of the key benefits it provides. So with an informational appeal, we're usually just offering information, hence the term informational appeal, right? We're so creative in the marketing world. Um, so here's an example on the next slide of an ad for the sexy green car show somewhere in the UK that um, shows a lot of different ways in which consumers can educate themselves and act in a more economically conscientious manner when it comes to their vehicles. So here's an example here. Take a moment and look at this as a form of an informational appeal. So you'll notice here they're giving you all these different ways um, that your, your vehicle can become more green. So lots of information they're sharing with you there. Also, you can have an emotional appeal, which kind of aims to satisfy consumers' emotional desires rather than their needs. Uh, typically, these appeals, these emotional appeals, will focus on uh, feelings about oneself. And the key to a successful emotional appeal is using some kind of emotion to create a bond between the consumer and the brand. And there's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, I'm going to talk about a love and sex appeal for a moment. So. Uh, Axe Body Spray, we've all seen the Unleash the Chaos um, little videos and advertisements in the world with the half-naked guy coming in on a horse or um, getting out of the shower, whatever it might be. He's trying to create some kind of love or sex appeal in customers with this Unleash the Chaos, Un Unleash the Chaos brand where we're trying to appeal to those emotional desires. You know, you want to be loved, you want to be sexy, whatever it is. Um, in other respects, you might just be trying to appeal to someone's comfort, like say a Kleenex. Uh, you know, there's all these different types of Kleenex. You can get the kind with the lotion, you can get the kind without it. And their slogan is softness worth sharing. Okay. So there's all these different types of emotional appeals, and I'm going to let you read about all those in your book, but there's, it's a really great section. I really enjoy um, that aspect of advertising, so read through those. Okay, our fifth step in our process is to evaluate and select media. So typically the content of an advertisement is tied really closely to the characteristics of the media that firms select to carry that message. And this is where we get into media planning. Media planning is just the process of evaluating and selecting the media mix, that combination of the media that's used and the frequency of the advertising in that medium that's going to deliver a clear, consistent, compelling message to the intended audience. So an example for you, um, Macy's may determine that the media they would like to use is um, a heavy dose of TV, some radio, some print, and some billboard advertising for the holidays. So they've chosen which vehicles they would like to use to carry the message, and they're choosing the frequency as well. They may really hit TV advertising hard, but maybe not as much on the billboards, or they may really hit print advertising hard, but maybe not as much on the radio or vice versa. So um, media planning involves figuring out which media method you would like to use and the frequency of advertising in that particular medium. Okay. You can characterize these various types of media um, into two types, either mass media or niche media. Okay. Our mass media channels include things like billboards, newspapers, magazines, radio and TV, and mass media channels like this are usually used for reaching the masses. That's why we call it mass media. We're trying to reach large numbers of anonymous audience members. And you see a billboard here with the Red Lobster that says, yes please, exit 93 and then right. So we're just trying to get everybody to come to Red Lobster. Okay, we're, we're appealing to the masses. Niche media, on the other hand, is usually very focused um, and it's used to reach a narrower segment. 
um, often with some kind of unique demographic or certain interest. So an example here of niche media would be specialty TV channels like Better Homes and Gardens or a specialty magazine like the Cosmo magazines. These are all niche media. So uh, Cosmo is generally advertising to women and Home and Garden might be advertising to homemakers. So uh, you'll find products in those magazines and advertisements in those magazines and um, TV shows that are trying to appeal to that certain demographic group with those similar interests. So hopefully that helps to differentiate for you between mass and niche media. Now, um, a lot of times advertisers struggle with choosing the right medium, deciding um, you know, what's going to be best. Is it TV? Is it radio? Is it billboards? What's going to be the best thing? So for each different class of media, every alternative has some kind of specific characteristic that makes it suitable for meeting your advertising objectives. And you just have to look at which one fits best. So for example, a consumer might use different media for different purposes. And um, an example of that, TV is usually used for people who want to escape or for entertainment. So I don't know about you, but after I've had a super, super long day at the office, you know, I just want to come home and and just veg out on the couch. I want to watch some Netflix and eat some ice cream and just take it easy. Okay, so in this aspect, a lot of TV advertisements rely on a mixture of visual and auditory techniques. They're not going to put something up there you have to really think and concentrate and try to read. Um, they're probably going to give you something you can just be looking at your phone and hear. Um, so, Communication media also varies in their ability to reach the desired target audience. So, again, as you're looking at choosing the right medium, if you are a grocery store or a fast food chain and you're trying to market your products, the radio might be a really good opportunity for you. Why? Well, generally because people are listening to the radio in their cars as they're going somewhere where they might be passing your restaurant or they might be passing a store, they might be on their way to the grocery store. So typically that's helpful. And it's also just a highly effective means to reach consumers um, in an auditory fashion because what else are you gonna do while you're sitting in the car other than listen to something? Now that we can't, um, we, we're no longer able to hold our phones in Tennessee. Um, so you kinda just have to sit there and listen to something. Um, so. Radio can be very helpful for that, and you're at a crucial point in your decision process if you're passing a store or you're on the way. I have a lot of spontaneous decisions to, to whip into Sonic and get a milkshake or um, you know, whatever it is that you're craving. You might have an impulsive decision there, and the radio might help spur that decision for you. So this chart will go through, and there's two pages here. It's going to give you each of the mediums over here on the left and then some advantages and some disadvantages for using each of these mediums. I would encourage you to pause these two slides and come back and really read through all of these and give them a, a thorough reading to make sure you understand this. Um, I'm not going to go through each one individually because I've kind of hit on all these, but uh, please do take a moment to read these. Okay, something else that you need to know about choosing the right medium is that all of these mediums, radio, TV, internet, they all vary in terms of their reach and their frequency. So advertisers, especially towards the end of an advertising campaign, want to determine effectiveness. And one of the best ways to determine how effective their media mix has been in reaching their target audience is by calculating the GRP, which is found by multiplying reach times frequency okay and this will help you determine um, your GRP of the advertising schedule now speaking of the advertising schedule after you've gotten your mediums worked out and your frequency and all that good stuff another important decision for a media planner is the advertising schedule and this schedule just determines the timing and the duration of your advertisement. And there's three different types of schedule. So we have um, continuous advertising schedules, flighting advertising schedules, and pulsing advertising schedules. And you can see my graphic down here. It shows you kind of a visual what that looks like. 
A continuous advertising schedule is exactly what it sounds like. It runs steadily throughout the year, and it's generally suited to these kind of products that are stable and purchased at steady rates all throughout the year. Uh, generally, these kind of products are those that require some level of persuasive or reminder advertising. So they're a lot of times products that have been out there already. So laundry detergent is a great example. Uh, you buy laundry detergent all year, fall, spring, winter, and summer, because you always have to wash your clothes. Um, so Tide usually uses persuasive and reminder advertising in a continuous fashion. That's why you see the, con the continuity bar here going all the way across from January through December. It's being used continuously. Whereas uh, a product like sunscreen probably has more of a flighting advertising schedule, meaning that they have periods of really heavy advertising and then nothing. It kind of comes in spurts, okay? This makes sense when you think about a product like suntan lotion. If you live here in, um, I'm, I'm in East Tennessee here, where typically you only need suntan lotion during the the summer months whenever it's really hot outside and you're going to burn or maybe when you're going to the beach during beach season um, that's when you typically see very very heavy advertising of the suntan lotion and typically the few months leading up to summer as well so if you go back and look at your flighting schedule you can see oh they had a little bit here nothing and then a little more here so that's flighting advertising Okay, and then pulsing is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It combines both continuous and flighting advertising schedules by maintaining a base level of advertising that takes place throughout the year, but the increasing your advertising during certain periods of time, whenever your advertising might be more intense. So, for example, you look at airlines, hotels, car rental companies, these people might advertise year-round just to ensure brand awareness, to make sure that people know about their brand. But during really spike periods, they might really hit up and um, advertise more. Or maybe if there's a low demand period, they might advertise more then. So going back to our graph, you can see pulsing. It's still continuous, but they have a certain time where, boom, they really advertise heavily here. And oh, again over here, we're going to advertise more. So continuous flighting, and pulsing advertising schedules. All right, so once we've determined our schedule, we're finally to our, almost our final step. We're going to go ahead and create our advertisement. So once we've gotten our message, the type of ad, the appeal, we're going to go ahead and make our advertisement. And this is where we start looking creatively. Everybody thinks about advertisers and marketers as being creative people. This is where that creative aspect comes into place. This is where you start looking at words and colors and pictures and music and all those things coming together to create an ad. So uh, this is the hard part. Even though you get to be creative and gets fun, it gets to be a little bit more difficult. Um, and it depends on what you're trying to do. If, you, if your message now is translated into an image, you're likely going to show that image on the TV or in a magazine. If you're trying to show a price, you're probably going to display that verbally over the radio or maybe in a newspaper where someone can read it. Okay, And then if you have a certain target market you're trying to reach, um, you might do that through some kind of electronic media vehicle like social media, for example. Um, the tricky part about this is that when you're using multiple different types of media to, uh, for the same product to deliver the same message, it's important that you keep your marketing integrated, that you keep it consistent, okay, so that all these different executions deliver the same consistent, compelling message to the target audience. So what that means is that if you're tied and you're advertising for laundry detergent, um, that everything that you're saying about your laundry detergent on the radio is the same thing that you see on TV, and that's the same thing that appears in a social media ad. You don't want to have an ad that says your product is on sale for $25 here, $30 somewhere else, and $40 somewhere else. You want to be consistent uh, both with your product description, your prices, all of those things. So we know we need to create an advertisement and we know that we want it to be um, consistent. So how do we go about doing this? What, what are our steps? So once we 
consider our objectives of the ad, what we want to accomplish with the ad, and our target consumer. Remember our unique selling proposition as well, and then how we're going to coordinate with this, all of the IMC elements. We now go ahead and actually put together our ad or our ad campaign. So I'm going to give you an example step by step of kind of how this goes. So there's this product that was marketed in the UK, I believe, um, and it's a personal alarm, the ILA personal alarm. So as they were making this ad, the first thing that should stand out to you is the visual. In this case, the visual is this um, almost looks like a phone. It's an alarm clock. but um, this should be the first thing that probably stands out to you whenever you're looking at this advertisement. Now, not always possible to hit all of your advertising objectives just by looking at this visual, but as much as you can hit with the visual, the best. And you want to kind of create some kind of unique and favorable impression to interest your readers uh, with your visual. Next, right after your visual, the next thing you look at is your headline, which in this case is ILA Personal Alarm. After you see that, you generally look at your subhead, which is your smaller headline that says it screams for your safety. So generally when you're writing headlines and subheads, you want these to be short, concise. You want them to use very simple words. Uh, ideally, it's great if you can get the name of the brand in there, which in this case they did with ILA. It's also great if you can pose some kind of interesting or thought-provoking idea. So it's a personal alarm. It screams for your safety, right? You're kind of interesting people with that. Oh, what kind of alarm is this? Why does it scream for my safety, right? You're interesting people with your words. After that, the next thing that generally the consumer's eyes will navigate to after the visual, the heading, and the subheading is the body copy, which in this case is this very, very small text down here, which I've written for you here. I'm going to read this to you. The text says, protect yourself this party season with the ILA Dusk Personal Alarm. As well as looking pretty, it emits a high decibel human scream for help, the only fashion accessory you need to be seen with this Christmas. So now this all makes sense, right? The personal alarm, it screams for your safety. Um, typically, this body copy will kind of explain more in depth what everything you saw elsewhere in the ad is about. Okay, and finally, after you've gone through these steps, looking at each of these, the last thing you typically see are your brand elements. Usually that includes the sponsor of the ad, some kind of logo. In this case, M&S is a department store in the UK, and that is their logo. Um, and then usually your other brand elements you're looking for is some kind of unique selling proposition. This ad doesn't really have one of those. So as you're creating your ad, these are all things you're going to try to make sure you have. Some kind of visual, a headline, a subhead your body copy, and then some kind of identifying brand elements. If you go on to take a class in advertising specifically, you'll learn a lot more about those things. But for right now, I just want you to know these basics. OK, um, so this kind of summarizes what we've been talking about here in a little visual for you. OK, and our final step here of our ad campaign, the last thing we want to do is we want to measure the success of our ad campaign. We want to assess the impact that we've made using some kind of advertising and marketing metrics. So to do this, we usually measure our advertising effectiveness before the campaign, during the campaign, and after the campaign. Okay, so generally we do this before with pre-testing, during with tracking, and afterward with post-testing. I don't know why that says pro-testing. Um, so let's talk about pre-testing. So before an ad is implemented, we conduct this type of assessment to ensure that the various elements are working in an integrated fashion and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So we're testing everything out before it ever goes to market. During the ad, in the ad campaign, we're monitoring some key indicators uh, in a process called tracking. This is where we might look at daily or weekly sales volume. Um, and we're, we're going to do this while the advertisement is running to kind of see if there's any problems with the message or with the medium that we might need to change and adjust. Um, after the ad campaign is over, 
we, we get involved in what's called post-testing, and this is the evaluation of the campaign's impact after it's been implemented. And at this very last stage in the process, we usually look at sales and the communication impact of our advertising campaign. So this is the tricky part. Measuring the sales impact can be especially challenging because there's so many other influences on advertising other than just the consumer's choice or the consumer's attitude or the consumer's purchase behavior. There's so many other influences out there that we can't control and that makes this really difficult. Um, and these influences can be everything from a competitor's advertising, which we have no control over, um, the economy, the economic conditions in the target market, which we have no control over, sociocultural changes, um, the availability of in-store merchandise, and sometimes even just the weather. Okay, so for example, um, the sales resulting from even just the best advertisement can be totally foiled by a lack of merchandise in the store. So you go to get something and you've seen an ad and you really want it and you get there and oh, they've sold out of it, they're out of it. Or, oh, there's a blizzard and that really affects, you know, we were running this just for one weekend, but there's this huge snowstorm and nobody wants to get out. So there's lots of things that can influence um, why an advertising campaign did or did not do well. Now, for your more frequently purchased goods that are typically in the maturity stage of the product life cycle, like I think about Coke, for example, any kind of soda, your sales volume usually offers a pretty good indicator of advertising effectiveness, okay? Because it's been out there for a while, people know about it, it's in the maturity stage. So if sales were relatively stable and other elements of the marketing mix and the marketing environment aren't really changing, and then we have this awesome advertising campaign, we can probably attribute any change in sales, any positive influence there to our changes in advertising, okay? It doesn't always work like that, but especially with those products that are in the maturity stage of the product life cycle, when you make some changes in advertising, generally you can attribute increases in sales and sales volume to our increases in advertising. So um, here's an example and um, this awesome little visual. We use a statistical tool called time series analysis to look at our sales data from the past and use it to kind of forecast for the future. So you can see this darker orange color. This was our natural demand for the product. This is we're talking about Coke. This is um, how much Coke we sold throughout the whole year. It's pretty steady for the most part. Seasonally, we might have a certain sale certain times a year when uh, we've done a little better there and we can see our seasonal advertising there in this lighter orangey peach color. You can see it there with spiking up. But we had this one special promotion here in the yellow. That was our advertising campaign. And look, we can really attribute that increase in sales to our advertising campaign there. We refer to this additional sales as a lift, a lift, okay? Um, we're really creative people in marketing, you know? So this increase we refer to as a lift. Okay, we're plunging right along, guys. Something else that may interest you are our ethical issues in advertising. I keep coming back to ethics uh, pretty frequently because that is one of our our objectives for learning for this class. We want to make sure you know how to market things ethically in society. So in the United States, there's a lot of rules that govern advertising that a lot of people don't know about. And some of these are a mixture of both formal and informal restrictions. Um, and all of these are really in place just to protect consumers from deceptive practices. Um, now, there are a lot of different federal agencies that regulate advertising. I'm not going to make you memorize those for the purpose of this class, but I am going to show them to you. Everything from the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, to the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. You can see um, lots of different institutions that regulate our advertising. And the problem is that recently, um, we've even seen the state attorney general offices have started to, they've kind of got more involved in recent years in advertising practices and they're kind of asserting their authority to regulate advertising. Something else that's interesting is that the European Union is actually more restrictive than a lot of the U.S. federal requirements. So you may see that sometimes with supplements or 
medications and things that aren't available in Europe that are in the U.S. So you have to be careful when you're traveling abroad for that reason. So anyway, I just want you to be familiar with these various institutions that regulate advertising. But most of all, I want you to know that deceptive advertising is illegal. Okay. Now, that being said, what's deceptive and what's considered puffery are two totally different things. Okay. So puffery refers to just the legal exaggeration of praise, stopping just short of deception about a product. So you're just kind of puffing up the product. You're embellishing a little bit. You're not lying. You're just embellishing. So for example, uh, the dating site Match.com may claim that it leads to better first dates. Um, and that's pretty, that's just puffery. That's not deceptive because better is a subjective measure. It could be a better first date because, hey, maybe you didn't have a first date at all. Or it could be a better first date because you get to vet the process and see the person's face first to make sure that, uh, you know, you're not going out with somebody you don't find unattractive and you don't know until you get there kind of thing. So, okay, it's a better first date. All right, we can go with that. But if it said it guaranteed more second dates, that would be deceptive unless it could actually have the, the marketing metrics and the advertising metrics to go back and back up its assertions with some kind of numerical and quantitative data. Otherwise, it's deceptive advertising, which is illegal. So you'll notice a lot of advertisings, uh, a lot of advertisements now in recent years use puffery. And I'm going to show you some examples in just a moment. But as you're looking at ads, I think you're going to see that in, uh, now that we've talked about it and you've learned about it. But um, here's an example of some wrinkle cream. Notice nowhere does it say that it prevents wrinkles, only that you have less wrinkles with this product. There's no way to guarantee this one has less wrinkles than another, but it's subjectively believable. So therefore not deceptive. Um, and yes, even cartoon bears must follow the rules. So if you notice uh, by looking at this picture, you may be familiar with Charmin, the toilet paper. Notice that the Charmin bear has to be drawn with just a couple little tiny pieces of toilet paper on its little rear, okay? Because if Charmin said that they eliminate toilet paper altogether, that'd be deceptive. That's not necessarily true that that's possible, but instead they claim to leave less toilet paper than other brands on average, which is just puffery, okay? So puffery is not necessarily illegal, whereas deceptive advertising is. So you can get away with puffery in advertising. Okay, so we spent the majority of our lecture talking about advertising. We're going to shift gears here and talk about public relations for a moment. Um, so we talked about PR a little bit in the promotions chapter, but essentially PR just involves managing communications and relationships to achieve various objectives. And usually this is involved with maintaining a positive image for the firm, um, handling or heading off any unfavorable stories or events that relate to the firm, and maintaining positive relationships with the media in general. So in many cases, these PR activities support other types of promotional efforts that you have going on because they generate free media attention and usually just general goodwill. So let me give you some examples of these here. Um, and first, I want to talk about cause-related marketing. Uh, cause-related marketing is defined in your book as a commercial activity in which businesses and charities form a partnership to market an image, product, or service for their mutual benefit. So a form of public relations advertising that Chili's, the restaurant, typically gets involved in, that is a form of cause-related marketing, um, is a, I'm not sure what they actually call this, but it's, we'll call it the Chili Pepper campaign. Um, you may have gone to Chili's during the month of September, in which they typically have these chili peppers that can be colored in, usually for children, um, and they sell them. You can purchase one for a dollar, five dollars, whatever, and put your name on it, color it in and you get to put it on the wall. Um, all of the money they raise from that campaign goes to support uh, the St. Jude Children's Hospital. 
Okay, and also during the month of September, at the very, very last Monday of the month, they donate, and every chili store does this, they donate all of their proceeds for the month um, to St. Jude. And as of now, they've raised around $54 million dollars for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So this is cause-related marketing because it's still a commercial activity. You're encouraging people to come to Chili's, uh, but they're forming a partnership with a charity like St. Jude's um, to kind of market an image, a product, or a service for bro both of their mutual benefits. So come to Chili's and try our products, try our food, and we're going to donate our profits to St. Jude. Um, so they both kind of get a little bit of exposure here. It's positive PR. And here's a picture of what I'm talking about, if you've ever seen this before. This happens also with for other things like breast cancer awareness with shamrocks and um, lots of other great causes. Another form of PR is event sponsorship, and this is something you're probably all familiar with, but um, event sponsorship is just where a corporation will support some kind of activity, usually financially, but it could be in other ways too. And this happens a lot in the sports area. So uh, if you look at the title of a lot of college football playoff games, a lot of times now they include the name of their specific sponsor, like the All-State Sugar Bowl, for example. Um, okay, and I briefly just want to touch on sales promotion. We're going to talk about this more in our next chapter, but just want to hit on this now briefly for you. Um, we talked a lot about advertising, but advertising is rarely the only way to communicate with target customers. There's also a pretty natural link between advertising and sales promotions, which is why this is grouped in this particular chapter in our textbook. But sales promotions are those special incentives and excitement building programs that encourage customers to purchase a certain product or a certain service, and they're typically used in conjunction with other advertising or personal selling programs. So we're going to look at some different examples of these, but a lot of sales promotions such as like free samples or your pop, your um, point of purchase displays, they tend to try to build short-term sales, generally speaking. However, there are other types of sales promotions like loyalty cards, contests, sweepstakes um, that have become a part of firms' long-term customer relationship management programs, which they typically use to build consumer loyalty. And we're going to look at each of these and how they're typically used. Um, I want to point out that the, going back to something we talked about earlier, the sales promotions can be focused on wholesalers, retailers, um, in which case they're typically a push strategy, right? You're trying to push it on wholesalers or retailers, but they can also be targeted to consumers themselves where you're trying to pull your consumers in, in which case that would be a pull strategy. So each of these sales promotions will either be used as a push or a pull strategy, okay? Um, a coupon, for example. Typically, coupons are used... Um, as pull strategies, generally speaking. Um, and they are, we all know what coupons are. We've used them before. They're discounts on the price of a certain item, um, maybe a percentage off, maybe a dollar off. They're usually used to stimulate demand and can be used by manufacturers and retailers and newspapers. You can get them on products, at store kiosks, on the shelf, online, in the mail, Lots of different ways you can get coupons. Occasionally, these coupons are linked directly to loyalty programs. So when you get that coupon on your phone and it's scanned in the store, they can see exactly where you got the coupon. It might have your name attached to it, your email, or your social media page. That's where you found it. Um, the search terms, if you're like me and you're shopping, you as you're getting closer to the cash register in line, you type in, Belk discounts, Belk coupons, or whatever it might be, and you go and you find one online and get them to scan it really fast. So they can tell where you got it. They can tell what you searched and what website you got it from and all of that just by scanning your coupon if it's attached to a loyalty program. Um, here's an example of someone using a mobile coupon on their phone. This looks like maybe at Target or something. Um, so coupons are one form of sales promotion. You also might just find a deal 
hey, we all like to get good deals, right? So a deal refers to a type of short-term price reduction. Um, and this can take a lot of different forms. Maybe it's just a featured price, uh, some kind of price that's lower than the regular price, or maybe it's a percentage-free and larger packaging. You see that a lot with laundry detergent, like the 50-ounce container is the same price as the 38-ounce container, in which case everybody's going to buy the 50-ounce container because you get more and it's the same price. Another deal might be a, a BOGO offer, like a buy one, get one free, or a buy one, get one half. Uh, those are all deals. Uh, now, sometimes a deal can involve a form of special financing, like uh, extended repayment. So uh, this uh, you see this a lot with furniture, like if you're looking at buying your first um, sofa set, you can go to Ashley Furniture or Grand Zacks, and um, you might get 60 months no interest financing. That's a deal, okay? Or maybe you get reduced interest if you um, use their card. Um, so these deals typically encourage consumers to go ahead and try a product because they lower the risk by reducing the cost of the good. You do have to be careful though, if you offer too many deals at the same time, um, you kind of eliminate your profit potential because you gave so many deals, uh, those deals cut into your profits and you just kind of defeated the purpose of even doing this. So you have to be careful. That's what happened with Old Spice, with their Old Spice Guy campaign where we saw things like this. Uh, where just because you use Old Spice, you can obviously hold a snake, a poisonous snake, maybe, I don't know, just because you're using Old Spice. So, can't offer too many deals at once. Another form of sales promotion is a premium. And a premium is when we offer an item for free or at a bargain price to reward some kind of behavior, like buying or testing or sampling. Uh, this usually builds goodwill among customers who often perceive a lot of high value from these premiums. And um, you see these in a lot of different ways. Maybe uh, you get a free toy if you buy so many boxes of cereal. You just open one up and find one in there. Uh, sometimes a freemium is handed out at the store. You know, we appreciate you coming out today. It's Wednesday and tonight's Mexican night, so we're going to give you free chips and salsa. Or sometimes you get something in the mail for free, like... Um, if you've ever ordered your college books from, from Chegg, um, a lot of times in those boxes you'll get like a Red Bull or laundry detergent. That's a freemium, a, a premium. So these are usually really effective and can be very helpful for um, the brand's message and the brand image overall. Another form of sales promotion is a contest, and this is where a brand... Uh, it's some kind of brand-sponsored competition that usually requires some kind of effort from your part. So uh, our textbook company, McGraw-Hill, they actually do a contest every year where students are asked to share their experience with this textbook where um, they share photos and testimonials about things they learned and whether or not they liked it and if the examples were good or if they were old and um, they get to share that video and um, in exchange for that, they're put into a drawing to win a scholarship or an iPad or a MacBook or some kind of prize. So that's a contest. Uh, you're probably familiar with sweepstakes. This is a form of sales promotion that offers prizes based on the chance of winning. Um, so you, you might just fill out a form and then you get entered into a chance to win kind of thing. Here's an example. Um, a $5,000 home improvement sweepstakes. You just put your name in and you might get it. So sales promotions. Um, sampling is another form of sales promotion that offers potential customers the opportunity to try a product or a service before they make a buying decision. Uh, these are really helpful. Uh, honestly, one of the most effective ways um, to for promotion, a lot of the, one of the most effective promotional tools in selling products, but also the most costly. Um, these are really common with quick service restaurants and grocery stores. If you're, sometimes if you're in the mall at a food court, they might walk around with samples to get you to try something. Or um, Starbucks does this sometimes when they get new drinks. I was just in um, Ingalls the other day and there's a Starbucks in there and I was walking by and they were 
they they have some kind of new pink drink and they were like oh try this try this free sample and i'm like okay um costco and sam's do the same thing if you shop there um you can see sometimes these are enough to make a whole meal off of if you sample enough i guess but lots of different uh, forms of sampling as an effective promotional tool loyalty programs are also an awesome sales promotion um, and these are designed to retain customers by offering some kind of premium or other incentive for customers who make purchases over time. A lot of times these are tied back to long-term customer relationship management programs. And generally speaking, if your loyalty program is well designed, it will encourage customers to increase their engagement and increase their purchasing. Uh, so they want you to keep coming back. Point of purchase displays are also another really popular sales promotion. And these are, you see these all the time, usually at a cash register or a checkout, sometimes in, on the end of an end cap or in the middle of a store. Um, but generally, these are designed to increase a product's visibility and encourage trial of products. So if you're standing in line and you're waiting to pay for something and you see a candy bar and you stare at it long enough and you're hungry, you're probably going to grab it and purchase it. Um, in an online shopping environment, you also still have point of purchase displays. Uh, this might be a price reduction at the checkout, um, some kind of complimentary product that is featured on the checkout spring on the, the checkout screen. Um, here are some examples of these point of purchase displays, you can see all kinds of Nutella stuff here. Uh, this woman, this looks like a convenience store of some kind, and you can see all these convenience products uh, stashed around point of purchase displays. Coke Zero has one here. So lots of cool things. A rebate is another form of sales promotion. You're probably familiar with a rebate. Um, you get some kind of price reduction. Um, based on purchasing a product at full price, you just have to mail it in and get the rebate. This is really common with electronic products that offer a lot of mail-in rebates, usually like $100 if you buy a new iPhone and mail this in. The interesting thing is that a lot of people never actually take the time to bother mailing those in and redeeming them. So rebates are actually one of the most successful um, sales promotion tools at stimulating sales, but oftentimes have the highest margin as well because since so many people don't redeem them even though they offer such a large dollar amount in a rebate they still make a lot of money because a lot of people never bother mailing them in so uh, Verizon is the example that comes to mind if you buy a new phone um, you can get one of these and mail it in get the rebate money um, product placement is actually another form of sales promotion and this is interesting so when you're watching TV um, or your favorite TV show, whatever it might be, look at the shows and the products that you see inside of that TV program. Uh, the one that comes to mind for me is The Big Bang Theory, uh, which was one of my favorite shows. I've seen every episode. A lot of these take place in the Cheesecake Factory. And Sheldon has been known for even saying that he needs to get access to the Cheesecake Factory's walk-in freezer. Um, but you can see in regular episodes, they're shown eating there and some of them working there. So product placement is everything. And you see it, you see those people going there and automatically you want to go to the Cheesecake Factory. Um, so here's an example of that. Okay, again, I'll give you some time to read through these on your own, but please do come back and read through all these different types of sales promotions. Again, this gives you some advantages and disadvantages of each one as you're creating your ad campaign. Um, the other thing that I would advise you with sales promotions is that you do have to be really careful how you use them, especially when your focus is on lowering prices, because depending on the item, a consumer may stock up and just stockpile when a certain item is offered at a low price, which isn't really all that good because it kind of just shifts the sales from the future to now and can kind of lead to some short run benefits at the expense of long term sales stability. So for example, let's say that you have some kind of um, household staple like laundry detergent or um, 
soft drinks if you're a big soft drink drinker and you see that and you see that they're offered at 50% off I have this coupon for 50% off and there's no restrictions I can just buy a hundred of them at half off if I want to well that results in a lot of people just stockpiling their soda or their laundry detergent which really doesn't go bad for that long and you just don't buy any more for the rest of the year well that's great if you're a consumer but if you're a company and you're trying to use um, the sales promotion to monitor your advertising campaign success, then that's bad. So you might offer coupons for things that are perishable, like yogurt. If Dan and Yogurt offers a half-off coupon, um, sure, it's definitely going to increase demand, but you can't stockpile yogurt. It goes bad. But it might keep you from buying Yoplait yogurt, and you might just get so hooked on the Dan and Yogurt that you keep buying it in future weeks. So, um, Sales promotions have to be used wisely. Another really common thing to do is cross promotion. And this is when two or more firms kind of join to reach a certain target market. And generally, the two products also have to appeal to the same market and together create value for firms. But an example that is relevant to me as a consumer, uh, I love shopping at J. Crew. It's one of my favorite stores. I also love Ray Ban sunglasses. Well, J. Crew has kind of teamed up with Ray Ban, and you can actually buy Ray Bans now at a lot of J. Crew stores, both in line, uh, both online and in person. And they kind of go together. If you're looking for a fashionable outfit, you go in and get a new shirt, some new chinos, and you have your Ray Ban sunglasses. They're all tied together. So cross promotion. Uh, Ray Ban might also include a link on their website to um, J. Crew items. So some overall takeaways for you here. Remember, the goal of any kind of sales promotion is to create value for both consumers and the firm. Uh, by understanding the needs of consumers as well as how best to entice consumers to purchase or consume a particular product or service, a firm can develop promotional messages and events that are of interest to and achieve the desired response from those consumers. And traditionally, the goal of sales promotions has always been to generate some short-term results, whereas the goal of advertising has always been to generate long-term results. Um, so generally, these sales promotions are short-term, like this month, this week, this, this quarter, whereas advertising has always been more long-term this year, this season, next year. Um, as we've seen, though, some of these can kind of go both ways. You can use sales promotion to generate short and long-term results and you can use advertising to generate both short and long-term results as well so it depends on how you're using the tool but in general you want to make sure you're using this tool to create value for both consumers and the firm um, and that you are knowing your customers needs and targeting those needs specifically so that's all I have for you folks I hope you have enjoyed our lecture and I hope to see you guys again soon thank you